Welcome to CLC Online. I am so glad that you've chosen to join us today. And since you're seeing me, I bet you know what that makes today. That's right, it's Mission Sunday. Unfortunately, it's a little bittersweet for me though because it's my last time hosting you as your missions pastor. I've accepted a position with one of our partners, One Hope, based in Florida. And while I continue to spread the gospel around the globe, I know that you're gonna do the same because missions is who we are. So on this very special Mission Sunday, why don't you drop into the comments, let us know where you're watching from, and share this video with a friend. We're gonna be right back in two minutes for worship. See you soon. Welcome back to CLC Online. We're about ready to start with worship, but if you haven't shared this post yet, please go ahead and share it. You never know who needs what we have to offer them today. We believe that God is doing some amazing things in worship at CLC. Would you stand to your feet and participate with us? Don't just be a spectator today, but really dive in and enter the presence of God because there is nothing that He cannot do. Let's worship. has a retreat Made so way, there's nothing that our God can't do. 
awesome and mighty God. <laughs> you are, you are. Amen. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Say, I will believe. Come on. For greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. So let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power. wherever we are the Lord is the Lord is my shepherd he goes he goes before me
in this moment we sing he's my comfort and he's my comfort always holds me close be assured in his presence that you are not alone oh god but you are a very present help you are not a man that you would lie Thank you, God, that you guide us, you chastise us, you love us, and you will run after the one. <laughs> you will run after the one. Thank you, God.
Father, that is truly our desire today, that we would be able to surrender everything to you, that we would lay aside our disappointments and lay aside our fears and lay aside even our dreams and desires to you so that you could have your way in our lives. We know that you have never left us, that you are always there, and so we can trust you in that surrender. So Father, that's our cry today. We're desperate for more of you. We surrender our lives to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need prayer for any reason, you can go to go.clc.tv slash prayer. And we have a team of people that will be partnering with you in prayer at any time throughout this service. And for those of you that are watching for the very first time, we just wanna say welcome. We're so glad that you joined us today. You can let us know in the comments below by saying, hey, I'm new. Or if you're more comfortable, you can go to go.clc.tv slash new. We'd love to get to know a little bit about you and as well as answer any questions that you might have about us. Now it's time for giving. And that is our favorite time of service here because we believe it's a continuation of our worship to Him. For those of you that have continued to be faithful in your giving, we just wanna say thank you. God is doing amazing things throughout the globe and we are able to partner with Him because of your faithfulness to Him. So thank you for giving. All right, it's time for week four of A Church That Heals. And Pastor Chris is gonna be bringing a phenomenal message about how we all play a part. So get ready, lean in, let's go. build on the foundation of your faith in Christ to help embrace the truth of God's word as it relates to your worldview, your past, your sin, your personal value to God, and your purpose in his kingdom. This group will help you remove every obstacle to intimacy with God and walk in true freedom. The Freedom Curriculum focuses on six areas of personal growth. Number one, living in the tree of life. God never wanted us to pursue dead religion. Rather, his heart is for us to know him personally and live in our true identity as his children. You will learn what it means to live in the tree of life and how a simple but powerful perspective shift can impact every area of your life. Number two, walking in the spirit. The Bible talks about the spirit-led life, but this kind of living can feel hard to reach. Through freedom, you will learn the principles of spiritual order and how feeding your spirit over your emotions and flesh is key to walking in the spirit. Number three, surrendering to Jesus. God calls us to love and serve him above all else. And when we do, we see how we can grow in our purpose, live forgiven and forgive others and receive his blessings. Freedom will help you learn how to surrender to Jesus and live in freedom daily. Number four, speaking words of life. Our words have power. And by learning to speak words of life that line up with God's word, your words can change your environment and relationships and break the power of the enemy's words in your life. Number five, becoming a vessel God can use. God has a unique plan and purpose for our lives, but we also have an enemy who is trying to keep us from fulfilling this purpose. In your freedom group, you will learn how to stand in the authority of Jesus to overcome sin and the enemy's schemes as you allow God to use your life for his glory. And number six, living as a worshiper. We all worship something. Freedom will help you learn how to daily direct your worship to God and discover how it can influence the heart of everything you do. One of our testimonials from one of our leaders who took the group said that understanding that the way we have learned about our spiritual beginnings started with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and how Satan keeps trying to get us to live our lives through this tree. But living in the tree of life is how God wants us to live. He wants us to bring our spiritual lives in order. So out of the overflow of the heart, we can live a life of surrendered to him daily through the continued learning of how to forgive others, how the power of our words can still kill, destroy. If we allow Satan's foothold, we have the power of the living word because we are vessels of honor. We can worship God in truth, thus be able to serve him in our church.
Hi, everyone. How are you doing this morning? You know what? I'm actually doing better. I'm walking with less pain, so I'm really excited. Now, you know, like all of you, I've been through some truly painful and difficult experiences uh, in my life. And I'm, I'm not talking about physical injuries here. I'm talking about the heart wounds that all of us have received. And I know that studying God's Word and, and prayer and worship play a major role in, in your emotional healing. But I also know that it takes people to help us to process our pain. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, verses 25 to 26 tells us, God's purpose was that the body should not be divided, but rather ah, that all of its parts should feel the same concern one for the other. Really, honestly, if, if one part of the body suffers, all of the parts share in its suffering. If one part is praised, well, then the others are, are praised also. Because we are a body, we really, we're connected, and, and we should feel concern for each other and help each other when they're hurting. Really, the church, the local church is the best place for emotional healing, and we all need to play a part in that healing. We all, you, me, we all need to help the hurting. So first of all, we're going to talk about my part. Just put your hand on your chest and say, my part. My part. Thank you. I know some of you are thinking, my part, what can I do? I'm not, I don't have any counseling classes, and, and I've not really helped very many people that are hurting. And honestly, I have a hard enough time trying to help my own hurts, let alone try to help somebody else's. But what I want you to know today is that you don't need a degree in counseling, and you don't need a lot of experience in helping people for these practical steps that I'm going to share with you today. And so I want to encourage you to, to understand that to help people, really, first of all, it's just giving grace. Give grace. Now, I, I know that uh, that's something we always refer to God, but we can give grace too. Since God shows you, Colossians 3.12 says, since he told you to be a holy people he loves, you must close yourself with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. You know, it, it all just starts with loving people and accepting people as they are, whether it's your friends or your family, uh, first-time guests or, or long-time members alike. It's, it's just about, we need, to, we need to be able to look people in the eye and say, hey there, we are so glad that you are here. And you know, we all have struggles too, so there is not going to be any condemnation in this room. Well, maybe we can't, don't say it in so many words, but the way that we interact with people, it, it, needs, it needs to shout grace loud and clear because only God knows people's heart and he's the righteous judge, not you and me. You know, there was one time I was trying to give some advice to someone and the Holy Spirit just tapped me on the shoulder and said, um, excuse me. You're doing my job for me. So, you know, giving advice may not always be the right thing to do, but I'm telling you that loving and accepting people as they are, that is always a part. So give grace. And the second thing that you can do is to listen more and speak less. You need to resist the temptation to uh, correct or instruct or regale others with stories of your own personal wounds. 
Because whether you realize it or not, that can end up being a my boo-boo is bigger than your boo-boo comparison. And that that really doesn't help anyone. And neither should you try to be that fix-it person who throws Bible verses at everyone like a, a one-size-fits-all Band-Aid. Rather, we should concentrate our love but just asking, you know, good questions and listening carefully. Focus on, focus on trying to better understand what they are going through. Be a compassionate and patient listener. James 1.19 says, Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen slow to speak, and slow to get anger, to get angry. I mean, truly listen to what they're trying to say to you and listen for the Holy Spirit's directives of what you should say and what you should not say. Because sometimes our words can, you know, unintentionally hurt rather than heal. When I was about 16, my best friend and next door neighbor, Janet, was hit by a truck and she died the next day of injuries. Now, I, her, I was a teenager. I didn't know how to process my pain. I didn't, I didn't know how to deal with my pain. And there were well-meaning people. I'm not saying that they were bad. They were well-meaning people, but they would say things to me like, well, it's better that she died because if she had lived, she would have been a vegetable. <laughs> that didn't help. My, my thought was, why did she have to hit, be hit by a truck in the first place? Why didn't God heal her? You know, their words hurt. They didn't heal. I mean, think about it for a moment. What if you had this terrible painful loss. I mean, it was so devastating that you can hardly breathe. And then someone comes up to you and say, this is all for your good. <laughs> well, that might be true according to scripture, but if you're really overwhelmed with pain, you are not ready to hear anything like that. And so you need to know what what not to say, and, and you really should not just tell them to forgive and forget because none of us have a delete button and it's not that easy. And we shouldn't say everything happens for a reason. Honestly, don't use any cliche. If you've heard it said before, don't say it. And don't say I know what you're feeling because you don't. Now, you may uh, have gone through a similar situation and the pain, but you have different support uh, networks. You have different coping mechanisms. You have different experiences uh, from which to draw strength from. Every pain is different. Now, I want you to understand that you shouldn't laugh either. I know that sounds weird, but I have to tell you that I have fallen down the stairs so many times that my kids started to laugh at me. I'd be falling down the stairs, and then one of them would say, you okay? I'd say, yep. <laughs> they would laugh. I mean, I, I fell down two steps coming out of the, the house, and I fractured my foot. You know, I, I fractured my foot coming down one step in step aerobics class. I, uh, I'm so good at falling downstairs. In a, one house, we had a, a staircase that went down, and then had a landing, and then it went down this direction. I'm so good at falling downstairs, I would, I would roll all the way down to the landing, and I'd make the turn and keep up rolling all the way down to the floor. <laughs> oh, my goodness. One time we were at Pastor's house, I was on the top step. I made a slip, and I rolled 
I mean, not just fell. I mean, I rolled all the way down, hit my head on the cement landing. You know, no broken bones that time, but I was so bruised. But you know what? My best fall story happened when we were building the first building here. Uh, we lived in a farmhouse, a uh, hundred-year-old farmhouse, right next to the, well, really where the parking lot is now. And I had gone to the front porch because UPS had left a package, and it was the wallpaper that I needed to, to wallpaper one of the offices in our new building. And so I was paying attention pa package. I walked over the iron grate that covered the old septic tank, and for some, probably because it's 100 years old, it broke. And down I went to the septic tank. Now, I don't know how, but I managed to keep from going all the way down. I caught myself on my one elbow. And honestly, I really don't know how I managed to pull myself up and get out of the hole, but maybe it was angels. But I managed, and I crawled up into the house because my knee, my leg was so messed up. I was finally taken to emergency care. The intake person came in and was looking at me and, and said, how did this happen? And I said, well... I fell into the septic tank and told her the story. Now, she kept a calm face, but as soon as she started going out of the room, she started giggling. And then I heard some whispers, and then another person came in and said, uh, how did you hurt yourself? I told them. They walked out, started giggling, told another person. I think I caused every person in that urgent care facility to have a good laugh that day. What was I talking about? Oh, yeah, yeah. I got sidetracked here. I was talking about watch what you say. Because what you say can hurt. It's better to listen uh, than to speak. But, but I will say this, that not saying anything at all, not doing anything at all, that, that hurts. That hurts even more when, when you avoid people because the depth of their pain makes you uncomfortable. I noticed when Janet did, that people died, people started to avoid me. I mean, they gave me wide berth. You know, they, they walked way around me like we were in pandemic way back then. And honestly, I, I felt like a leper because I felt so isolated and alone. So don't do that. Don't don't ignore them or, or avoid them because you're not comfortable. There are some things that you can say. There are some things that will be helpful. Like say things like, I'm sorry for what you're going through. And you don't have to go through this alone. I'm here for you. And how are you doing today? And if you're not okay, that's okay. And what would make your life just a little bit easier? right now and I've been through something similar would it would you like for me to share what helped me these are just simple things that we can say that will bring help and healing now the second thing that we can do is to show love through actions rather than throwing you know <laughs> Uh, cliches at people. Oh, when they're hurting, pray with them. Pray with them. Weep with them. Give them a shoulder to cry on. I remember the Sunday after Janet died. For some reason, the church announced Janet's death during the service. I don't know if it's because I had brought her to church and youth events, but I do know that after they made that announcement, one of the young women came and sat next to me. And she put her arm around me. And she left that arm to the rest of the service. We were not even, we were not even really friends. We were not even that close. But I'm telling you, what she did that day uh, did more to help heal my pain than everything that was said or done before that. And honestly, even to this very day, 50 years later, it touches my heart that her just being there for me, her just 
putting her arm around me. So I'm, I'm just encouraging you, you know, just be there for people. Now, you've probably heard preachers talk, talk, and talk, and talk about Job and, you know, all his losses. Oh, and, and Job experienced some, just some traumatic losses. And his friends initially were really good. They came and they sat with him for seven days in the dust. And they didn't even say a single word. Believe it, it's true. You can check it out in Job chapter number two. You know, we mostly remember Job's friends because of the hurtful things that they said when they finally did speak. But initially, they entered into his grief and sorrow by just sitting there, just being with him. You help people just by your presence, your presence alone. First John 3, 18 says, Beloved, Children, our love can't be abstract theory we only talk about. But it needs to be like a way of life demonstrated through our loving deeds. And so we just can understand that when people are hurting, life itself can be overwhelming. Just day-to-day life. And you can help, you can help take up the slack by doing simple acts of loving deeds like take meals to them or 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 take phone messages uh watch their children run errands for them mow the grass uh, send texts notes even books in the mail when we invest time doing just really little things it it truly makes a difference When my father passed a few months ago, you guys were such a blessing to me. These are the cards that I received. When my father passed and I broke my foot and COVID and all that was going on, I can't tell you how much these cards meant to me. As, as you can tell, I've kept them. I've kept every single one of them because they meant something to me and they really, really helped me. So do just small things, even a card, and you will help someone who is hurting. Now, I'm going to talk about your part. For those of you who are wounded, I want to talk to you for just a few minutes about what you can do with a pain. Now, now these are practical steps for you that you can do, but I'm not going to tell you they're easy. And you're not going to be healed overnight. I told you a couple of weeks ago that healing takes time. And whereas the healing might not come as soon as you would like it to, it will come. It will come if you do these simple steps. And the first is just to speak your pain aloud. It will be easier for you to turn your pain over to God. Easier if if you embrace the pain, if you, you talk about the pain, if you acknowledge it, if you give it a voice. I don't know why we have this whole idea that we've always got to say the right thing. You know, how are you doing? Blessed and highly favored. You know, I mean, I don't know why we do that. I don't know why we think that's right. Or or we think we have to put on the happy Christian mask for everybody. Or we have to right away get back to doing our regular activities. It's, it's like we think God wants us to do that. Like there's an 11th commandment that says, fake it. Till you make it, otherwise people will question your walk with God. Who cares what anybody thinks at this time? It's not about what people think. It is about your healing. Pain festers in the silence. And so the quickest way to healing is to face the, the pain head on, straight on, to embrace it, to talk about it. Talk about it. 
Because when, we, when we're vulnerable and we share what, what we've been going through, well, then we find people who have gone through similar pain and, and we don't feel all alone and, and perhaps we do get some comforting words if we share, if we open ourselves up. So, to, so share, share with a trusted friend. Share with a counselor. Share with a leader of the church. Just don't act like everything's okay. Don't wear this happy Christian mask when things are not okay. I think that's why I believe so strongly in small groups here at CLC. Because when you're in a small group of believers, you you make a connection that you you can share with, that you can be yourself with, that you can get help from. That you can, that you can get care from. Who will cry with you? Who will celebrate with you? So if you are not in a life group, ah, uh, get in one today. You can go online and get connected with a group of people who can care. Now I'm going to talk to you for just a few moments about wound care and what you need to do. Uh, while they were driving nails in Jesus' hands, or while they were torturing him, Jesus said aloud, Father, forgive them. I think he was trying to show us that the sooner we forgive, the better. Because just as a physical wound has to be cleaned out, so it doesn't cause an infection, our emotional wounds need to be cleaned out. And, and forgiveness is the choice that has to be made to clean out the bitterness and resentfulness, the hurt, the anger, the guilt, the self-pity. They're all contaminants that will hinder our ability to heal completely. You know, my husband talked about this last week so well. I just, I just want you to know that even if you're having trouble making that choice to forgive, just to ask God for help. Because with all God, all things are possible. It might not seem, it might not seem possible to you at this moment, but with His help, you can and you need to forgive. And, and the next thing you do is you need to, you know, to, Protect the wound. If, if one of my kids came with a big, gaping wound, bloody wound, I would probably faint first and then call someone else for help. <laughs> but most of us, when we see a gaping wound, we bind it after it's clean so that no contaminants can get in and delay the healing or even stop the healing make or make it worse. And we need to... Uh, protect our wounds, our emotional wounds. We need to protect our emotional wounds by guarding our minds. And you're thinking, minds? How does an emotional wound, what does it have to do with our minds? Well, think about it for just a minute. Where are your wounds stored? They're not stored in your heart. Your heart is an organ that just pumps blood. No, your wounds are stored in your mind because our minds are the storage facility. So because our wounds are in our mind, our thoughts have direct impact on them. And we need to to Be careful of what we're thinking because, honestly, those thoughts can infect the wound and keep it from healing totally. You know, when we're thinking about the pain and what we're going through, all the time we're thinking about people said and what they didn't say, what they did and what they didn't do, and we're focused on the pain. It's like like scratching a skin. Gab. It, it opens you up for infection, and it, and it really does hinder your healing process. So guard your thoughts, and rather than focusing always on the pain, focus on God's word and his promises to you. Focus on what he has talked to you in the past. Focus on what God wants you to do through your healing season. You know? 
the last thing the enemy wants is for you to get your thoughts off yourself and onto ministering to someone else. So since that's the case, that's what we're going to do. We're going to get our focus off of ourselves and on who we can minister to. You know, when Jesus was on the cross, he said in John 19, 26, and 27, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciples, to the disciple, excuse me, here is your mother. In the midst of his pain, Jesus noticed his mother at the cross. Rather than just be focused on himself, he focused in on her and what she needed. And Jesus was leaving a powerful remedy for our pain. And so if you're suffering, you need to look out for the needs of others. Ask yourself, who can I help? Who can I serve? And lastly, exchange your brokenness for healing. Jesus declared in John 19 and 30, it is finished. Now he wasn't, he wasn't saying, oh, praise God, I'm so glad that is over. It wasn't a complaint or a groan. It was a, it was a shout of victory. In, in the Greek, these three words actually come from one word, telestai, which means paid in full. And when Jesus sacrificed his life, he wasn't just putting a substitute punishment. Jesus was making a full exchange. He was exchanging all of himself for all of you. Jesus was exchanging your pain and your hurt for his joy and his healing. Jesus has already done all the work. You just need to receive it. You need to exchange. Exchange your brokenness for his healing. Psalm 34 and 18 says, if your heart is broken, you'll find God right there. If you're kicked in the gut, he'll help you catch your breath. I'm talking to someone here today whose heart has been broken. And the good news is that you are in the right place right now to receive healing because God God is here, and I want to help you. I want to help you to heal that wound and to change the rest of the course of your life. If you would like that, would you just pray with me? Father, thank you that Jesus bled and died for me. He bled and died for my healing and for my salvation. I ask for you to come into my heart right now. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I want to live for you now and always for the rest of my days. Thank you for healing me. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer really for the first time, you just received Christ as your healer, your savior, and your friend, I want you to text the word LIFE to 708-998-4516 so we can send you some information that will help you with this walk and continue your walk of healing and victory. Now, I just want to talk to those of you who have been listening today, that you really are in a lot of pain. You are hurting. You are broken. You are wounded. Right now, I want you to visualize putting all of that pain in your hand. Everything that was done to you, any abuse, loss, whatever the cause, I want you to put it in this hand. 
Visualize it. And now I want you to give it to Jesus and drop it at his feet. Let it go right now in Jesus' name. Pray with me, Jesus, heal my wounded heart. I receive your grace. I receive your healing and bring that healing to your heart right now. Jesus loves you more than you can possibly imagine. And I know that at times during the pain you wondered, Jesus, are you there? Do you care? Do you love me? I'm telling you today, he does. As someone who's gone through some terribly broken times in my own life, I'm telling you today that Jesus Christ loves you. He cares for you. And he is in the process of healing you right now. Receive it in Jesus' name. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Chris, for that excellent message. Hasn't this series been great? I believe that God has done a healing work in each of us during this series, but you don't wanna miss next week. Pastor Jerry is gonna be speaking on a topic that he has never preached before in over 30 years of ministry, so you don't want to miss out. Speaking of missing out, have you signed up for a life group yet? We officially launched last week, but it's not too late for you to join a group. Go to go.clc.tv slash life group and get connected. Speaking of getting connected, did you know that we offer Growth Track online? Growth Track is a great way that you can get to know about yourself and get to know about us as a church. And we would love to have you join us. You can go to go.clc.tv slash growth track. Get connected and join us. We're so excited about what God is doing in this season. Speaking of excited about what God is doing, we have a very special video from one of our missions partners in India. Take a look at what God is doing because of your faithful giving. India recorded its first coronavirus case on January the 30th, 2020. In an overpopulated country where social distancing is nearly impossible for most, the number of coronavirus cases began to spread aggressively. On March 24th, the Prime Minister of India ordered a complete lockdown of the entire nation, immediately prohibiting people from leaving their homes. The lockdown lasted for 68 days, resulting in great chaos, hunger, starvation, and immense suffering, particularly for the hundreds of millions of poor and migrants. As large-scale hunger and suffering began to spread across South Asia, the native missionaries of Indian Evangelical Team obtained permission from local authorities to reach out to the suffering masses. The native missionaries spread out to thousands of villages and towns of South Asia, reaching out to their neighbors and other villagers. They provided food bags to hungry villagers trained them on hand washing and the importance of social distancing. The native missionaries of IET also started distributing masks and soap. Most importantly, the missionaries prayed with every individual they helped during this difficult time.
on behalf of the people who received help from Indian Evangelical Team. I want to say thank you. You gave us the money. We bought the material and we gave it to them. Because you helped, thousands of families are eating their at least one square meal a day. Thank you. Thank you. One of our values here at CLC is to give big and go far. And that's exactly what you just witnessed. Because of your faithful giving, we were able to be the hands and feet of Jesus and provide basic needs like food for the people of India. So thank you once again for your faithful giving. If you're ready for the blessing, now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week. I love you guys. We'll see you soon. I like to close my eyes and lift my hands and move them side to side. How do you like to worship? I think that it is time for you to show us by standing up, standing up, standing up, stand up, and do what you like to do to these worship songs. Let's do it. Yeah. He's got a, he's got a, he's got a plan. He's got a, he's got a, yes he do. He's got a plan for me. He's got a plan for me. He's got a really, really, really awesome plan for me. He's got a plan for me. He's got a plan for me. He's got a really, really, really awesome plan for me. That's what I know. Oh, that's what I know. That's what I know. Oh, that's what I know. Let's go. I know that I can trust him. Yeah. I know that I can trust him. Yeah. No matter what the season. Yeah. His plans are for a reason. I know they are good, I know they are best The reason I love is because he said He's got a plan for me, he's got a plan for me He's got a really, really, really awesome plan for me He's got a plan for me, he's got a plan for me He's got a really, really, really awesome plan for me That's what I know, oh, that's what I know That's what I know, oh, that's what I know And when I'm feeling so sad They sold him because the dad didn't give him a coat. You remember his name? 
Yes, Joseph. And today we're going to see how the story ends. Do you remember everything that happened to Joseph? Yeah? He was his daddy's favorite. He had amazing dreams. The guy was going to do something awesome. And then he got sold and put in a hole. And then he went to prison. And a lot of bad things happened. But then God used them in Egypt to feed a lot of people that were hungry. But let's see what happens at the end of the story. You want to know? Do you want to know what happens? Yeah. Well, let's go to the clubhouse. Who? Who? You know what time it is? It's time to hear a story full of wonder. There's so much fun we'll have learning together. So let's go down, go down to the clubhouse with Ollie and his friends. Let's go down, down, down to the clubhouse where wonder never ends at the Wonder Clubhouse. We miss you at the Wonder Clubhouse. We miss you. Mm, yep, I have strawberries for Kai and uh, gummy worms for Lucy. Oh, hello there. Welcome to the clubhouse. It's me, Manny, and I'm so happy to see you today. So I'm making sure we have all the things we need for everyone to follow their ice cream sundae plans. Let's see. Kai wants vanilla ice cream. Check. Lucy wants chocolate ice cream. Check. Now let's check our toppings. Kai wants whipped cream, check, and strawberries, check. Lucy wants gummy worms, check. I want chocolate syrup, oh, and sprinkles. Lots of sprinkles. Wow, I think we have everything we need for everyone to follow their ice cream sundae plans. And each plan is different. Who? Who? Hey, it's Ollie. Hello, Manny. Ho, ho. Following some party plans, are you? Hi, Ollie, I sure am. Everybody has a different plan for their ice cream sundaes. You have many different plans. It's true. I have a story about the best plan for you. Just listen to this story. Just follow me through. Ho, ho. Follow me through. Ready? And go! <laughs> oh, hi friends! I'm Carrie the dog walker, and this is my best dog, Stormy Jane, and her friends, Goldie and Barkley. We're celebrating Ice Cream Sunday Month with a doggy Sunday party. I think they like them. <laughs> We're also celebrating because we have been learning about God's plan for Joseph, and today, we get to hear the last part of his story, and it is awesome! Do you know who this is? Yep, it's Joseph. He always trusted in God's plan. And these are Joseph's 11 brothers who got super mad and jealous when their dad gave Joseph a special coat and didn't give them one. So they stole the coat, threw Joseph in a hole and sent him with people who took him far away from home where he was thrown in jail. Then Joseph was taken out of jail, helped the Pharaoh learn about his dreams, and got put in charge of giving hungry people food. Wow, three cheers for God's plan. God's plan is awesome. Hip, hip, hooray. Can you say that with me? Ready? Hip, hip, hooray. One more time. Hip, hip, hooray. No matter how hard it was, Joseph knew that God loved him, that God was always with him, and that he could trust God's plan. But that's not the end of the story. There is more to God's plan. Remember Joseph's brothers? Well, now back at home, wait a minute. Stormy Jane, you're not a brother in the story. Get out of there, silly dog. That's better. Okay, so back at home, the brothers were super hungry and had no food. And guess where they had to go to get food? You got it. They had to go see Joseph because he was in charge of all the food but they didn't know Joseph was in charge. Well, one day, Joseph was at the palace when his brothers came looking for food. Joseph was so surprised to see them. Show me your surprise face. <gasps> That's good. Joseph had a choice to make. Choice one, 
he could forgive his brothers and give them food to eat, or choice two, he could just send them away hungry. What do you think God wanted Joseph to do? Choice one, you're right. That's exactly what Joseph did. Joseph forgave his brothers and gave them food to eat. He even gave them a hug and was happy to see them. It was the best ending to the story because Joseph followed God's plan. I love how Joseph followed God's plan. I want to follow God's plan, and you can too. God's plan is the best plan. Oh, hey, Ollie. Ollie, tell me, who has a plan for you? God has a plan for me. Yes, it's true. Now let's hear it from you. Tell me, who has a plan for you? God has a plan for me. That's the truth, friends. You better believe it. See you next time. Bye. So there's your story. It's all true. God has the best plan of all for me and for you. Thanks, Ollie. Goodbye to you. Ho, ho. Wow, what a great story. Joseph's life really shows us how God's plan is always the best plan. God loves us so much and always has the best plans for us. I think I got the story. Did you get it? If you did say got it, get it? Got it! Good! God's plan is always the best plan. But we have some great plans for our ice cream sundae party too. I can't wait for the party to start. I'll see you guys next time. Bye! God has an amazing plan for you and for me. And there's times that people are mean to us and they don't do things that, that we think that they should do. Have you ever had a friend that is mean to you, Kelsey? Yeah, she's always mean to me. And it's not nice, but it is important for us to learn how to forgive them, just like Joseph did to his brothers. When they had a need and they came to Egypt, he didn't say, mm -mm, you go hungry because you were mean to me. No, but he gave them food and he hugged them and was so happy to see them because he knew that all along God had a plan for his life and that everything that he went through, even the bad stuff, were part of the plan. Isn't that awesome? God has a plan for you and God has a plan for me. So tell me, who has a plan for you? God has a plan for me. Who has a plan for you? God, God has a plan for me. Good job. And I just want everybody to stand up. Everybody stand up. Are you ready? Are you ready to move? Because we're going to say our memory verse. Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Jeremiah 29, 11. Let's say it one more time, but I wanted to say it so loud that everybody hears that God has a plan for you. Are you ready? For I know the plan I have for you, says the Lord. Jeremiah 29, 11. Good job. I love you. I miss you and I will see you in the next one. Goodbye. Goodbye. here. Man, I hope you've been having a fantastic September. Uh, your September might look a little bit different than last year's September. But first, before we get started on our Sunday lesson, I need to tell you that I am so incredibly proud of you. I know that school feels and looks 
a lot different this year. And some of you may like it and some of you may give it a thumbs down. But I want to tell you, no matter how you feel about it, you are doing a great job. And I'm very proud of you for handling all the changes that are happening around us. And that God is good and he is with you the entire time. Okay, okay. So this lesson, we are going to continue to talk about friendships. Now, today's lesson is all about forgiveness and friendships. See, we can't be perfect all the time, and so we need to forgive each other, whether we've done something wrong or our friend has done something wrong, but forgiveness makes friendships even better, and we're going to find out how. All right, guys, this is the moment you put on your thinking cap, and you grab your family and your friends, and we get ready to worship, to learn and grow in Jesus, and I will see you on the other side. Jesus, you have been so faithful. Jesus, you have been so true. I will be forever thankful. Cause I never had a friend like you. Help me to be who you've been to me. To everyone I see. Let us love one another. You with me in the darkest valley You with me on the mountain top I'm thankful that you never leave me And that your love will never stop Help me to be who you've been to me To everyone I see Let us love one another with our love Like no other yet That's the way you love us, God
next week and I'm not actually cooking anything right now <laughs> I'm inside that would be a cook in <laughs> so i would never really cooked from any of my friends before so I just wanted to be prepared because I want them to still be my friends after the cookouts over just kidding that's not how friendship works friendship is using your words and actions to show others you care I don't think friends should stop being friends for little things like food tasting bad. Mmm, oh, it's delicious. And I think you can even stay friends with someone if they say, accidentally burn you with a hot potato. Hot potato, hot potato, hot potato, ha, 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 ha. Friendship can last through most anything. Unless a friend makes fun of my hat, then it's over. Time to flip an imaginary burger. <sighs> Woo! Today's story is about a time when one of Jesus' friends did something really bad. Jesus could have flipped out. <laughs> but he didn't do that. He didn't do that. I'll see you soon. Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, can't turn the camera off with the mitts. Sorry. The Bible, it's 66 books of history, stories, letters, and poetry that fit together to form God's one big story. The epic adventure of how he created us and loves us so much that he made a way to rescue us. As we travel through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we discover people who met God and found their lives changed forever. And now for an amazing story, Inspired by the book of John, chapter 21, verses 1 through 19. Peter hauled in the knotted net yet again as the first light of dawn gleamed in the eastern sky. Empty. Not a single fish all night. Thomas shook his head. Uh, I doubt we'll catch a thing before it's time to take the boat in. John studied Peter thoughtfully. Peter, you didn't really want to catch fish anyway, did you? You just wanted to get out in the boat and do something normal. Peter shrugged, but he knew John was right. Over the past few weeks and months, everything in his life had turned upside down. First, Peter had shown the courage to speak the truth about his friend Jesus. You are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. Many people wanted to make Jesus king, even though the religious leaders hated him. The day before Jesus was killed, Peter had promised Jesus that he would follow him anywhere and even give up his life for Jesus. But that very evening, Jesus was arrested. Peter was so scared, he told three different people he wasn't Jesus' friend. I don't know that man. Peter felt sick about what he'd done, especially when Jesus was nailed to the cross and died. But then he returned to life. He appeared to his friends. It was amazing. Incredible! Everyone was excited beyond belief. Except, Peter must have wondered. Is Jesus mad at me? Am I still his friend? Does he still love me? Now Peter found himself in the boat, trying to figure it all out. His fingers tightened on the wet rope as he prepared to cast a net one more time. As he glanced over on the shoreline, he saw a figure standing there. Friends, don't you have any fish? Nope, not one. Throw your net on the right side of the boat. There you will find some fish. The seven disciples in the boat exchanged glances as Thomas laughed. I seriously doubt it. You guys have anything better to do? Let's give it a try. Together, the men heaved the heavy wet net back into the sea on the other side. Hey, I 
think we've got something. Bring it on in. There's one fish. Two fish. A red fish. Ugh. A blue fish. And another one. And another uh, ten. Whoa! Need some help here. The net was so full of fish, they couldn't haul it into the boat. They began towing it to shore. John gaped at the man still standing on the beach. It's the Lord. Excitement raced through Peter's veins. He was about to see Jesus again. But just as quickly, guilt gnawed at his stomach. Facing Jesus meant he had to face how he denied knowing Jesus. But it's Jesus. I've got to see him no matter what. Grabbing his coat, Peter jumped out of the boat and into the water. He half ran and half waded to the beach when he discovered that Jesus started a small bonfire. Fish and bread were already toasting over the flames. He's God's son and he's making breakfast for us. Jesus smiled at Peter. Bring some of the fish you have just caught. Uh, yes, Lord. Peter ran back to the lapping water to help his friends haul their fish to shore. 153. You counted? Don't doubt it. Jesus gestured to the disciples to join him around the fire. Come and have breakfast. As the disciples gathered, Jesus offered them bread to eat. John whispered to Peter. This is what he did when we last ate together at the Passover meal. When breakfast finished, the disciples rose to take care of their fish. Peter found himself walking beside Jesus. There were so many things he wanted to say, but he couldn't find the words. Simon Peter, do you really love me more than these others do? Peter swallowed hard. Surely Jesus knew what he felt. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs. Peter remembered how Jesus would compare people to sheep in his stories. Peter, do you really love me? Lord, you know that I love you. Take care of my sheep. Sheep? People. Peter waited in his mind. Jesus must be telling Peter to take care of the people who had followed him. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. Just as Peter denied knowing Jesus three times, he now confirmed three times that he loved Jesus. What's more, Jesus wanted Peter to go out and share that love with others. He's forgiven me, even after what I did. Peter, things are going to get even more difficult for you. You are going to be led places you do not want to go. Peter slowly nodded his head. He was willing to do anything Jesus asked of him. Follow me. Yes, Lord, I will. Because Jesus had forgiven him, Peter was now free to share the love of God with those around him without carrying around a heavy load of guilt. Okay, so picture this. You have a best friend. You do everything together. You eat together. You play games together. You tell each other everything. And then when your life gets really hard and you need your friend there the most, your friend pretends she doesn't even know you. That's not cool, friend. Wouldn't that make you so mad? It would make me want to say goodbye to that friend forever. But Jesus didn't do that when Peter pretended not to know him. Instead, even though he must have felt so hurt inside, Jesus forgave Peter. Now, I know what you may be thinking. It was pretty cool for Jesus to forgive Peter like that. It was. But guess what? Jesus forgives you and me like that too. Anytime we mess up, we break a rule, or we do something we know is wrong, Jesus forgives us. That's because he loves us so much and because our relationship is more important to him than our mess ups. That's why the one thing to remember today is this. Friends, forgive one another. Jesus forgives us, so we should forgive others. Our friendships should be more important than our mess ups. I'm not saying it's easy to forgive. It's not. You're going to need God's help, but get this. When you choose to forgive, it can help you feel better inside. It can help your friend feel better inside, and it'll make your cookouts way more enjoyable. <gasps> Speaking of, this imaginary corn is almost done roasting. Oh, look at that. <sighs> oh, what? Oh, this is gonna taste so good when they're real. Goodbye, everybody. Again with the mitts. Hey guys, welcome back. That's right, we are learning that friends forgive each other, even when it's hard. 
See, we can't go a lifetime in a friendship without making some type of mistake um, because we're human and we all make mistakes. But what we do learn is that when we forgive each other, and just like God forgave us, that forgiveness isn't just for the other person, but it's also for us. It helps us to heal from what we've been hurt from, what was said or what was done. And God can do something great in us when we forgive others the way God forgives us. So think, if you forgive each other, your friendship can be bigger and amazing and even stronger because you're learning, huh, I get to be me and I get to make mistakes and my friend forgives me. Just when they make mistakes, I get to forgive them. So if you're having trouble with, I don't know how to forgive or what I should do, ask an adult or a parent. They can help you, even if you think they can't. Parents and family members actually can give really good advice. All right, guys, I hope that was helpful and I hope you have great and amazing and strong friendships because life is fun when friends are around. All right, guys, I'll see you throughout the week.